today. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to, to end on our, our 3D printing tip of the month to give some tips on how people can 3D print faster. So uh, we talked about face shields on the last episode of the podcast. And if you're tuned into 3D printing stuff, I'm confident you've seen all of the 3D printing efforts for PPE. Um, and 3D printing is always slower than injection molding. Um, but there are some tips and tricks you can do to be able to print uh, as fast as you can. Um, I think uh, Stefan over at the CNC Kitchen channel did a really cool video talking about his print settings that took a model from, I think, three hours down to under an hour. And so by playing with different parameters, you can see a lot better results. Uh, so the first one I have is to have the right hardware. Um, a lot of 3D printers in the, in the area where they melt the plastic called the hot end, it only has about 10 or 20 millimeters of heated area. Please and tell that me that's an official term, the hot end. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it really like, I don't know. <laughs> hey, don't, don't touch the hot end. Like, that's what it sounds like. Heater block. That's the only <laughs> other name I can think of. No, it just sounds like don't. a labeling for dummies. Like, this is the hot end. <laughs> like, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I've just always accepted that it was the hot end. But you're right. It's, it's kind of a, a very simple... Naming convention. You're not going to get it wrong, and if you burn yourself, it's your own damn fault at that point. So <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to learn quick, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> but a lot of the the stock hot ends on printers only have a very small area for the plastic to melt before it gets pushed out of the nozzle. Um, compared to our printers that tend to print much faster than the type of stuff that Ken and I have at home, um, they have a substantially larger melt zone in their hot end. Um, and there are even some upgrades that a lot of different companies make where you can increase that melt zone. And that's gonna help you print a lot faster. Uh, increasing your nozzle diameter. Um, the Fortis, for example, has interchangeable tips, depending on what layer height you're using. That helps you print faster. Um, increasing layer height is the second tip that I had. That's a, a very simple way. Instead of printing in 0.1 millimeter layers, if you're printing in 0.2, it'll print roughly twice as fast because you have less layers to make up your object. Makes sense. Yeah. The third tip that I have is to add more shells and decrease your infill. And so that can give you kind of an equally as strong part while using less printer movement. So you can end up with a faster print. And when you're adding those shells to your part, you can actually increase the extrusion width. So instead of doing three shells, you might only need two shells to get the same thickness of plastic on the outside and therefore roughly the same strength of your part. So I guess one question you had mentioned earlier I wanted to, to pick at, you had said that injection molding is always faster than 3D printing. So why are we printing all these face shields? <laughs> We're printing all the face shields because it takes time to make an injection mold. Like you were talking about, three to six weeks. And so even companies with injection molding capability in the States, it takes time for them to, A, stop everything they're doing now um, and uh, divert their resources to make a brand new mold to validate the mold design and to uh, install it on their injection molding machine and actually start making it. And so 3D printers, because they're able to make anything within reason, right? Um, you, can, you can make a variety of different objects without having to make that tooling. They were able to kind of immediately switch over. It's that, that tooling making time that made 3D printers more responsive than injection molding. And I think, um, when did we start printing parts? Was that back like beginning of April or even like slightly before the beginning of I April? I think in, in March we were it printing like parts. Late, late March, yeah. It seems no like idea. forever, yeah. But you've definitely seen less and less of the 3D printing PPE in general, just around social media, because like Adam said, once that tool is made, I mean, you got injection mold companies making... 3,000, 5,000, <laughs> 3,000, 5,000 parts a day. We're making what? 
maybe a hundred <laughs> fifty fifty parts a day on our couple machines. Mm-hmm. So right. the, the the economics and the scale is just nowhere nowhere close. But if you need parts now, that's your trade off. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, shout out to all the companies who have a three D printer in house and injection molding, and all the all the staff still there that were able to make all those face shields. Um, in my Facebook feed, Smith and Wesson, I didn't know they had 3D printers, but they went in l- a little over a week, they said. They started using with injection molding, making a thousand face shields per day. And that was in just over a week because they had 3D printers to make the prototypes. I'm, I'm sure there's tons of other companies out there that did the same thing, too. I think the important thing with with that kind of company, too, is they have the internal machining capability to make their own molds. A lot of the companies we go to, even the injection mold companies, don't make their own molds. They they outsource that to specialized mold makers. I wonder if that'll change. I mean, uh, the outsourcing now seems that everything's well. Hold on. Do you mean when they outsource, are you saying they're going to another country or just another Shop. Not just always. Shop. I would say the majority. I would the majority I've talked to usually go to another local facility, a specific machine shop that makes molds. Okay, so they're not going out of the country at least. But okay, you I can still get them. But more that I've talked to tend to get them in the United States. I uh, I've had a different experience. I talk to companies all the time who were like, "Oh, where do you get your molds?" And they're like, "China. It's always China. It it takes ten weeks, but you know we deal with it because it's so cheap." And they're they're happy doing that. Yeah, that's the trade off. If you've got the time, then find the cheapest option. But if you if you're on tight tight tighter deadlines, then your choices are limited. Yeah, I uh, I would imagine that people will start insourcing sourcing things domestically a lot more, given all the the supply chain hiccups that people have been experiencing. Mm-hmm. Um, Insourcing and uh, relatively local manufacturing, I think, was already kind of a global trend. Um, but we're only going to see that accelerated. Yeah, if anything, I'd, I'd expect simplified supply chains. So you're less dependent yeah. or either you're either going to bring stuff in or you might diversify more to where you're using more suppliers for a particular component. Because you imagine some industries, when a single supplier goes down, your your whole operation goes down. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do. I think even onto a consumer level, I think our supply chain is going to simplify. And going back to having a 3D printer in your home, uh, whether or not that's going to be the case next year, but I think everyone is going to start trying to uh, at least buy local or be more self-sufficient. That means making your own stuff. So be it. But at least with the supply chain that we've seen, it has, it's actually pretty darn fragile. I think uh, in-house is an awesome idea. I think as more people um, adjust to the new conditions and changes or whatever it might be, I think one result is more people fixing things instead of buying another one. We have such yeah. a, a throwaway culture that having a 3D printer makes me less likely to just toss the baseball tee and go buy another one. I'll fix it. And if I've got more tools to fix more things like that, that something maybe I bought from China and I'm not going to get a, you know, another little widget band to go around this again. All right. And I can make it and I can preserve those and I can make them last longer. This is a kind of a question that's not super related, but have any of you started trying to just buy made in America whenever possible? I have, yeah. Um, not not because, uh, uh, sadly, not out of just like an abundance of patriotism, uh, but really because <laughs> I'm impatient and uh, Amazon <laughs> takes a long time. I do tend to buy a lot of three D printer parts to tinker with. Um, directly from China. Um, Did you just say they, Amazon takes too long? Yes, they are. In, in the current <laughs> they've been backed world, up. yeah, Amazon, they've prioritized. Okay. They've prioritized certain currently, things yes. over consumer goods, and 
you can you can imagine if you're one of the hundreds of thousands of essential workers, you don't necessarily want to pack up Adam's 3D printer parts. You'd rather pack up something that needs to be done. Boo. Which makes me Everything very upset. Essential. <laughs> <laughs> My hobbies are essential, Kevin. I, um, I don't think I bought anything outside of groceries. Really? <laughs> like, no? you know, I don't think I've spent anything in a month. No, well, uh, I haven't. I can't relate to that. I've I have been impulsive. It's definitely been limited. I wouldn't say I've cut everything out, but it's definitely a lot less than, than before. I bought a new Apple Watch because mine broke, so that did not come from Made in America. But... Outside of that, no. I, I don't think I bought anything except beer and groceries. I just found out that I can have ammunition shipped directly to my house. <laughs> and what a wonderful thing that was. I look outside in the mill every day. I can see it from my window. I'm like a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, it's here. <laughs> Other and than I'm that, that way with yeah. printer filament. So <laughs> I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> So real quick, I have two more time-saving tips if you're 3D printing things. <laughs> oh my oh. goodness, I forgot. Yeah, well, well <laughs> Keep going. Remember when this was the segment and we just totally derailed? I Should think that was more are? interesting conversation anyway. But uh, minimize your Z height. So when you're positioning your part, make it as short as you possibly can while allotting for overhangs and all that other stuff. And the last tip is minimize your downtime. And so... Don't let your 3D printer sit there all night not making anything. That's a waste of time. We saw this with the face shields where people started stacking them and having them be able to break apart afterwards. Uh, when we started doing that uh, in the office, we quickly changed pace from doing like 10 or 20 a day to doing like 40 or 50 a day because the printer would keep going all night and then we'd just toss it in the wash tank, the support would dissolve away, and then you have a whole handful of like 10 or 20 face shields so making wow. sure your 3d printer isn't being lazy and resting all night is a <laughs> is a very important aspect to be 3d printing fast is cad dimension still making face shields we aren't we uh we did it wow. for a long time um well a long time we did it for three or four weeks um but uh our sourcing for the transparent plastic that needs to go on the front uh, kind of dried up, and uh, I think we were happy to to pass the baton on to a lot of the local companies with injection molding capabilities who could do it way, way faster than we could. How many did we make? We did over a thousand. And we, uh, we gave them to a lot of, I think, friends and family and friends of friends who actually work in hospitals on the front lines. So... Um, we, uh, we put a lot of work in for a few weeks, coming in like nights and weekends to make sure the machines were, were okay. Um, but it was really rewarding seeing a lot of what Andy shared with us um, at our company meeting. The audience knows exactly about this. Um, but seeing, seeing all of like his screenshots of texts and Facebook conversations uh, of people who, who really benefit from it. Yeah, nice job. Did you Thanks, give one man. to your wife? <laughs> I did not. Wow. Uh, she's <laughs> she's one step removed from the front lines, thankfully. Oh good. <laughs> right. Is that it, guys? That's it. Thank you, audience, for watching uh this very special uh socially distanced podcast. Uh if you enjoyed watching today, make sure to leave a comment uh with a Hopefully some some words of encouragement. I know uh, things are difficult for everyone right now. Um, and tell us what your favorite segment was. I know when we uh, switched to the segmented format, um, we had a lot of ideas. So getting your feedback on which segment is your favorite would be awesome as we try to, to plan for the future of the podcast. Um, make sure to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss when we post next month's podcast. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. See you, everybody. <laughs>